from the 43rd chapter of Isaiah. We're going to look at verse 19. If you're looking for a verse to memorize, this is a good one. God says through Isaiah, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. Oh, what encouragement. Let us pray. Oh God, we ask now that you help us to make room for newness. We know, know that you make all things new. Make us new today. Speak your word through my lips and tailor make this message for each person here. Open your word to our hearts and open our hearts to your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here I stand with a Bible in English in my hands. Do you realize the type of historical journey that it takes to bring us to this moment where a preacher in Carver, Massachusetts is holding an English Bible in his hands. Oh, we may not realize all of the twists and turns and heroism it took to bring us to this moment. So let me tell you of it. A long, long time ago, in a land far, far away, some 3,000 years ago, a people of God were journeying with God and the Hebrews started to write down their stories. Stories of Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and Rebekah and Rachel and Esther and Ruth, all the great heroes of the faith. They wrote down their stories about King David and all those wonderful prophets from Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, some 3,000 years ago, writing down these stories in Hebrew. Well, it was some 2,000 300 years ago when 70 Jewish scholars traveled to Alexandria, Egypt to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek. Ah, right there, right there was the first impulse to translate the Bible in a language that others could understand so that they could encounter through the wonderful spiritual stories and truths of the Bible so that they could encounter God for themselves. Well, it was some 1,600 years ago 
that Pope Damascus declared that the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek should be translated into Latin. Latin, the language of the scholars, of the clerics, so that the Bible could be carefully studied. Oh, do you have any idea what a long, long journey it was to bring the Bible to us in our native tongue? It was in the year 1363 that a scholar at Queen's College at Oxford, Oxford, England, by the name of John Wycliffe, said that the Bible needs to be translated into English. It had been in Latin, and it was only being read by the scholars. But John Wycliffe believed that there was a spiritual church so beautiful, but, but the visible church, organized religion of his day, uh, was impeding the view of the true beauty of Jesus Christ. And he thought, oh, if, if we can just translate the Bible into English, then people could encounter for themselves the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that would make the spiritual church truly visible. So John Wycliffe and his students went to work and they began to translate the Bible into English. And so they would pass the manuscripts around. This is before the printing press, mind you. They would pass these manuscripts around from uh, village to village so that butchers and bakers and plowmen could encounter Jesus Christ for themselves in the gospel. But you know what? This made the church very uneasy. I mean, if people could read the Bible for themselves, they might discover that a lot of the doctrines and the dogmas of the church really don't have a good scriptural warrant. This, this uh, putting the Bible into English, uh, hey, this, this just might mean that, that people will come to their own understandings of Jesus. Uh, they will develop their own theology and not take the party line of the church. Dangerous. Well, in the year 1415, Bibles in English were declared illegal. Illegal. Now, John Wycliffe had been dead for 44 years. And you know what they did? They posthumously declared him a heretic. His body was exhumed and he was burned at the stake. Really, this is a rather uh, merciful timing, actually. I mean, to be burned at the stake 44 years after you died. It was considered a bad thing to have the Bible in the English language. It was too radical. It was too revolutionary. So the church and society outlawed Bibles in English. But some of those English manuscripts were still around. 
and this idea held on. Why can't people read the Bible in their own language? It took another hundred years uh, till a man by the name of William Tyndall said, you know, it is time that the Bible be written in English. But the Bishop of London outlawed it. And they had a big book burning. You know, the, the original book burnings were Bibles. They were burning the English Bibles. And the Bishop of London had William Tyndale strangled to death as a heretic. And after he was dead, they burned him at the stake too. But you see, an idea like this cannot be killed. People should have the Bible in their own language so that they can experience directly Jesus Christ in the gospel rather than through uh, government and church authorities, what they have to tell us. But those manuscripts continued to pass around. You know, it was said that uh, John Wycliffe's last words were, Lord, open the eyes of of the king of England. But the king at the time was Henry VIII and he had other things on his mind. Well, in the year 1553, Mary Tudor ascended to the throne and she made it crystal clear no Bibles in English. Bloody Mary, we call her. She was fierce. She was brutal. And she burned at the stake some 300 religious dissenters. This suppression worked. Oh, what a long, long journey. This is to get the Bible in English, in our language, so that we can understand. In the year 1604, James of Scotland ascended to the throne, and he's the one who said, okay, it's time that the people have the Bible in their own native tongue. And so he got scholars together to translate the Bible from Latin into English. And in the year 1611, we had what was known as the King James Version, which is the Bible that American Christianity is based upon. Oh, what a journey. What a journey. Do we even appreciate all of the sacrifice it took to bring the Bible into our own language? But you know what? The journey continues. It continues. I mean, hey, we're constantly having to make decisions. Uh, I mean, how do you translate the Hebrew, the Greek, the Latin, into English, we have to make lots of choices. And as one scholar said, every translation of a masterpiece is a failure. I mean, you'll miss some of the rhythm and the beauty and, and, and maybe ruin the cadence. You know, language can become turgid and slow, and sideways. Every translation really doesn't completely 
capture the true masterpiece. So we stay at it. We are continually translating the Bible to the point where we have a plethora of English translations of the Bible today. No one of them is perfect, but we have all of these different translations. We've got the Revised Standard Version, the New Revised Standard Version, the, the New International Version. We've got the New English Bible. We've got today's English on and on. Just go to Barnes & Noble and look at their Bibles and see uh, the many different translations that are available for your purchase. Wow! What a story, huh? All right. Now I've got you to the place where I can tell you what happened to me this last week. I once again ran upon a quote from William Blake who said that we become what we behold. Think about this. We become what we behold. Gosh, you know, I, if that's true, uh, you know, I wonder in, in our time with all of the media and the news and politics around, uh, you know, media that is violent and vapid and superficial and silly. I just wonder, uh, what if we behold that stuff too much? Do we become that? I think I know some people who have become that. I love that word, behold. Don't you? I just love that word. Behold. We, we become what we behold. I started thinking about all of those key Bible moments where the word behold is used. Like in the very first chapter of Genesis, when God saw everything that he had made, it says, Behold! It was very good. Behold, to, to, to receive its impression, to, to appreciate, to, to be more reverent. Uh, this scripture that we read today, uh, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Or what about in Luke, you know, when the angels came to the shepherds and said, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Or, or, or John the Baptist, who saw Jesus coming toward the Jordan, Behold, the Son of God. Or I think about... Um, that wonderful scripture uh, from Paul. Uh, Therefore, if, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Or I think about uh, that... Uh, uh, wonderful verse in, in the book of Revelation where Jesus says, Behold, 
I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Or what about there at the very end of the Bible, the book of Revelation? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell among them. Oh, I, was, I got to thinking about all these wonderful passages with the word behold, and, and I wanted to learn some more. So, so I began to search for passages with the word behold, and you know what I discovered? They're gone. They're gone. And then I learned that in 1990, translators of modern English versions of the Bible took the word out and they put in the more banal word to look or to see. They just took out behold. I don't like it. I mean, we lost some poetry, some depth to behold, to fully appreciate, to receive empathetically its impression. It's gone. Look at the verse that we read today in Isaiah. It's gone. So I said to myself, I'm going to preach it anyway. <laughs> it may not be in the Bible anymore, but it's a beautiful word. I'm hanging on to it. To behold. And I got to asking myself, am I got to searching myself? That, you know, this, is what, this is what happens when you get into God's word. You, you, you start taking it personally, and it, it works on you, and, and you start asking yourself these questions. Am I beholding things, or am I just watching? Just Am I just um, uh, taking on look, see, or, or am I behold? What about the people that we encounter every day? at work, at the supermarket, at the service station, at the coffee shop. What about all the people that we encounter? Do we really behold them? Do we appreciate them? Now, you're not going to get out of here without me giving you a spiritual practice. Here's what I want you to do. This week, this week, starting right now, just try this for a week and see what this does for you. Every day, the people that you encounter, pick out, I, I want you to really behold them and, and uh, find two things. Only two things that you can appreciate about each person you encounter. Not just one, because, you know, we can all find a quick one. I mean, like, you know, a smile or, oh boy, they have a, you know, nice comportment. Uh, but two things, two things about each person that you can appreciate. Now, I encourage you to do this because... Society is so critical. I mean, uh, we, uh, we always look on the, the downside. We always uh, look at, we, it's not hard to find people's shortcomings. But, but what if we actually behold them? Grow in appreciation of people. 
Oh, what would happen if we, like God, behold creation? Have you been doing that this summer? Have you been getting outside? Have you seen any sunrises? Have you seen any sunsets? Have you driven over to the ocean and watched the ebb and flow of the water? Do you, have you beheld God's beautiful creation, the expanse of the sky? Did any of you ever read the biography of Frederick Douglass? Frederick Douglass, a great orator of the 19th century, the most famous African-American man of his day. Frederick Douglass was a slave, and he was beaten horribly. But somehow, in his youth, when he shifted from the field to the shipyard, he was able to carve out a little time so that he could learn to read and to write. And, and he did. And, and he would gather other slaves around and teach them. He became one of the great minds of our history. I mean, one of the great thinkers and writers and, and speakers. At, at, at one point, Frederick Douglass escaped slavery. He became a fugitive, and he made his way to a free state, and it was in the 1840s that he would go from village to village, from town to town, speaking out against slavery, preaching the sin of slavery. He was one of the most famous abolitionist preachers in our history. And he was doing this some two decades before we finally outlawed slavery. He's the one who called to our attention by the power of his words, by moral suasion, the essential American sin of slavery. He was a great preacher. He was trained by another black preacher. He was licensed to preach, and that's how he learned to become a great orator. Just read his speeches. They're sermons calling us to higher ground, and at some point in the middle of his sermon, he would gather up that six-foot-two frame with his hair beautifully, perfectly parted, and he would outstretch his hands and he would say, Behold, I am a human being. And in that day, people didn't really think of Africans as fully human beings. And, and it, was, it came as a great surprise that an African man would have that kind of mind, that kind of presence, that kind of power and beauty. But he would say, behold the dignity and the worth of every human being. Hey, listen, I'm going to preach this thing of behold. 
I'm preaching, behold. Are you appreciating the good things around you? Are you beholding the good things around you? We talked about that a little bit last week, didn't we? With joy, finding joy all throughout the day. We become what we behold, what we contemplate. Are you beholding the Lord Jesus Christ? Listen to this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. And we who with unveiled faces all behold the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Beholding the glory of Jesus Christ and being transformed into his likeness. We become what we behold. Are you beholding the good things about the people around you? We become what we behold. So I'm telling you, behold. Amen.